I technically can't remember the first time I saw a Star Wars movie because I was actually brought into a theater showing a revival of uh, the original Star Wars back when I was really too young to remember. But I'd seen the Star Wars movies multiple times by the time that I entered school, so five-ish. Now that I am, well, significantly older than five, I have the interesting position of being able to talk with people for whom the uh, prequel trilogy is considered dated and awful visually, etc. And, I mean, there is no denying that a lot of those CGI effects aged really poorly. And so the original trilogy is right out for them. But as incredible as modern effects are, as awesome as the new Star Wars visuals were, as amazing as some of the superhero movies out there are, there's always going to be a part of me that remembers being a small child and is blown away by those effects from the original trilogy. From the blockbuster special effects, the revolutionary techniques that were used at the time. Because, well, that's my standard. I grew up at a time when those were still pretty freaking good effects. Similarly, no matter how old I get, I'm probably always going to have a bit of a nostalgic fondness for Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Chasing Amy, because I remember when they were new, and in a sense, groundbreaking, and that's kind of the thing. I think that for Chasing Amy, I do need to go into a bit of context, though, because um, a lot of people seem very unaware of the overall body of how LGBT individuals are treated in media. There is a propensity to make LGBT characters uh, victims of horrific crimes. And so this movie, while it has, I'll just be kind and say, uncomfortable elements to it, was one of the first movies I had actually seen with openly gay characters who weren't, like, completely derided and abused and or murdered. I think the movie was still bad in portrayal of uh, gay and lesbian characters because, let's face it, they're never going to touch bisexuals in any real sense, and trans characters are still a long way off in terms of any sort of positive outlook. But the novelty simply of not being like these horrific abuse victims was enough to sort of make it stand out in my mind. It was much like the Star Wars effects, effectively revolutionary at the time. It was kind of mind-blowing to actually see gay and lesbian characters not treated like complete dirt. Unfortunately, much like the Star Wars films, the novelty is sort of worn off, and looking at it through a modern filter, these are no longer groundbreaking ideas, or even necessarily positive ideas. But this novelty, just the fact that there were feature characters who were gay, actually seemed to be the reason that uh, the movie got so much praise from LGBT groups. And this is the answer to the oft-repeated puzzlement of Kevin Smith when he muses over the idea that, hey, the people who are bashing me for homophobia are the people who once praised Chasing Amy. It seemed groundbreaking at the time because it was more or less all we had, and so a little step, even a half ass step, was good enough. And there's this tendency when you're a minority group, especially a hated or victimized minority group, where little things are enough. It's sort of tempting to... It becomes easy to want to heap praise on people for simply not doing the awful things that people had done in the past. The thing is that eventually, once you get used to that, there is another step. We want more positive representation to be actually accepted rather than just tacitly sort of not killed or whatever. And that's where we lose people like Kevin Smith and Joss Whedon who don't seem to understand the desire for more because they very likely have never actually had to deal with a situation where this was good enough, where they had been so horrendously treated that simply the removal of abuse or misportrayal or anything else seemed like a huge step forward. 
And similarly, but I think a little more obviously to mainstream culture, Buffy had a sort of similar setup where there were only a handful of real female leads of any sort of action-oriented show at that point. And it seemed pretty groundbreaking to have this character. It seemed subversive, too, at the time. And then, you know, I got older, I looked at it more critically, and I don't think it's as subversive or intelligent as anybody seemed to think, especially not Joss Whedon. Still, it seemed revolutionary at the time, and people heaped praise on Joss and other people involved in the show. And I think that that ends up being a big mistake, and I know that it's a basic impulse because I deal with it on a regular basis. The problem is that Joss Whedon seems to think of himself as some sort of voice for women, but he does so to the point that he has a tendency to speak over women when they don't like what he does. When large groups of women get upset, he writes them off. Kevin Smith, for some reason, seems to think that making one movie about uh, LGBT characters a long time ago in a galaxy pretty close to ours suddenly gives him some sort of pass for the rest of his life and gets upset when people point out that he does a lot of things that are uncomfortable to a minority community that he supposedly doesn't want to harm. However, I would also argue that it's possible that these individuals and others like them might have been necessary because they were a starting step into getting better properties. Maybe not perfect properties, but better ones. Ironically, that means that they sort of ended up contributing to their own demise by inspiring the people who would surpass them and give us an opportunity to examine their properties better in context. But the progress does come from other people, people who have stepped beyond the point that these creators seem capable of doing. They have this frame of reference that is stuck in both cases pretty much in a 90s mentality about issues that impact people who are bothered by that 90s mentality now that we've made it 20 years past. And those voices will likely one day be replaced by other voices who are, dare I say it, even though it's a slur on much of the internet, more progressive. And those voices will also likely be replaced. There is still a long way, I fear, before we actually get a strong presence of LGBT creative teams at the top on any sort of writer-director level for mainstream films, at least commonly and without controversy. I mean, hell, it took us decades to get a single female-directed superhero movie because apparently, I don't know, women can't direct dumb action. And I mean, think about how sad that is. Women have been recognized as existing since the dawn of time where there's a much spottier history with LGBT individuals. So how many millennia must we wait? But that will be an important watermark because even if these products get criticism, they will at least be coming from within the community, not from people talking for the community or in the case of people like Smith and Whedon over the community. Still, it's kind of a depressing thought to think that we may have to wait another several hundred years before this becomes acceptable. So on that depressing note, thanks for listening. Amaranth out.